thank you. We're so excited to be here. Um, you've already introduced us, but I'm Alex from the Daily Front Row. I'm the CMO, which in many ways I say I'm the glorified cruise director of the magazine. Um, the Daily, for those that don't know, is a website and print publication. We have social media accounts galore, multi-channel media destinations, learn everything about fashion, beauty, lifestyle, celebrity. Um, we like to say we're for the fashion insiders and for the fashion obsessed, so there's something for everybody. And I'm so thrilled to be here, thank you, um, and to have this conversation with Katya from Birchbox, who is the CEO and founder of this brilliant concept that took the world by storm 10 years ago. So this is a, a great time. You started the business in an interesting time. We're talking now at a very interesting time. So we'll kick off our conversation. Um, first, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Birchbox and how this came to be. Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katya. I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I've been, you know, out in the East Coast now for, I guess, almost more of my life. So almost becoming native. Um, I started Birchbox in business school. So in undergrad, I studied economics and international studies, and then I went into finance for a few years. And at, in business school, I applied to business school. I started um, just kind of thinking about what would happen next for my career, whether I'd stay in finance. And it was there that I found entrepreneurship, which had not been on my radar at all. But when I found it, I became obsessed is a light word and very intentful about wanting to try to pursue it, mostly because I was obsessed with the idea that I wanted to meet myself and I wanted to know what I was capable of, um, not because I was expecting it to work, and so I'd say mo most days I'm still kind of having a pinch myself moment. Um, not that it hasn't had hardships and headwinds and there's been moments when I don't know if you would definitionally say it feels like it's working, but because I've had 10 years of um, running Birchbox, adapting Birchbox um, and really changing, I think the beauty industry and ultimately a lot of commerce in general into reconsidering the way that we build relationships with consumers. Um, so the insight with Birchbox for Birchbox was a very simple one. In business school, my co-founder and I, we felt like we were smart women um, who weren't particularly passionate about beauty. And we just noticed that we were both kind of underwhelmed by the options of how you discover and maybe overwhelmed by like, why are there so many options and why don't we understand how to take care of ourselves and, and where to invest and when it's worth taking a little extra time or when it's worth spending a little extra money. Um, and at the same time, we noticed that beauty was really underpenetrated in e-commerce sales. So 2010, it was 2% sold on the internet. And those kind of ideas of like the emotional desire to feel smart when we were shopping and also have fun when we were shopping came together with this market opportunity of, you know, people aren't buying beauty on the internet and they're going to. So why not us? Why can't we figure this out? And basically our insight was that the reason people weren't shopping online was because the options were too much and because there was an expectation in beauty that you would touch something and experience it before you purchased so in about 24 hours, we came up with the idea for Birchbox, which is a way to limit the options in beauty and grooming and allow you to touch and try a few things at a time that are personalized for you um, through a subscription. So in a cadence that is very regular and over time giving consumers an experience of having a lot of intent and a lot of confidence when shopping for beauty. That's amazing. And wow, how much this has changed from 2% purchased online in 2010 to, I don't know the figure now, you may know this. Is that a, something you it's know? Low. I think it's still um, pretty impressively low, just given that there's, you know, I think retail and offline is still the incumbent channel. So I'd say under 15% is still what's happening, but surpassing, yes, that 10% mark. And definitely at this very moment in time, I'd say uniquely online. I was going to say, we are now more of an online community and culture than we ever have been. So I'm excited to talk about how that, how that's going to evolve for you guys and how you'll be able to serve us all. But, you know, just going back to the subscription model that you, I mean, you were so innovative in all of that. And we've seen a lot of people that have come forth with it since. How has that model changed since your launch? And what challenges did you face from the beginning? And how have those morphed into something else now? It's a great question. Um, when we launched Birchbox, I don't know, you'll know this company. I don't know if all the people on will know this, but the other subscription company who I think I just launched was Shoe Dazzle. Um, so it was 
you know, a, a subscription business as well. Obviously fashion, if you don't know it, is of the month shoes. And um, we were also obviously around the time when even Prime was becoming more of a known quantity and a way of kind of really engaging and showing loyalty to a company. Um, so one of the first things that I really remember in, in running this business was when a lot of people started coming into the subscription business, us kind of like pulling our heads up and thinking, well, we didn't launch Birchbox to be a subscription business. We launched Birchbox to be the best way to discover beauty and um, and eventually grooming because we launched that a bit later and kind of reclaiming for ourselves what this business was because we never, we didn't invent subscription. Obviously that had existed magazines, even like stake of the month, but we didn't want to be known as something that was um, really just about putting customers on this like endless cadence of purchase. And more so we wanted to showcase the intent behind creating new demand for consumers via like using samples as a discovery tool and then leading them to make a purchase. So the idea for Birchbox has always been that it allows you to kind of change your routine, add to your routine and feel very confident and smart when you invest in products because you know you're gonna use them. And then you purchase the full size products, which we sell also. And so in the very early days, you know, we were just really focused on, I mean, execution initially, um, but eventually also just trying to help define that because subscriptions were becoming so hot. And we were trying to show, well, there's different kinds of subscription, there's replenishment, there's kind of an of the month, and then there's what we do, which is a marketing tool to generate demand and then having a e-commerce business to capture demand. So we did spend a lot of time trying to clarify that, trying to help um, the market, our brand partners and consumers understand the intent behind what we were, what we were doing. Um, and I'd say in the early days, the biggest challenge was getting suppliers to participate. Um, initially, it was because we were small. In a few months, it was because we were too big. And um, also because we were just an unknown brand and an unknown place to put their like very, you know, well-invested brands in. And it took a lot of time to showcase to them that we would care for their brands, that we would show an ROI in the sampling um, and building that reputation was a huge effort. Well, congratulations, you've done a very good job with that. And that's no easy feat, especially getting, you know, a 20 year old heritage brand to come in and start sampling with this type of thing. I know how challenging that can be. And you're really, it's a truly genius marketing platform. I think a lot of customers may just look at it as this is a cool subscription sampling, but when you really go into the numbers and what you can build for these brands and then send that back to your own e-commerce or just give people the sense of discovery and that that customer loyalty acquisition happening so early, it's, it's, it's genius. So marketers across the world, anybody that's been in business school has read about this. I'm one of them, you know, <laughs> that. So um, kudos to that. And it's very cool to see the platform continue. So the topic of this chat is fashion is the future of the beauty industry, which that can mean a lot of different things, depending what side of the world you're coming from. I'd love to know with you coming from primarily beauty and me coming primarily from fashion, even though we do, of course, parlay in there. Um, what's your perspective on this topic? And, and what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's speaking to the idea of trends. Um, and I think trends in beauty used to equate a lot to something that we could really easily see with each other, which was makeup. Um, and that's where we really saw the initial intersection of fashion and beauty. Um, for Birchbox, we've been really focused on a different aspect of the industry, I guess, starting with the fact that we're focused on a consumer who doesn't love beauty. So we're focused on, we call um, the customer, the casual consumer, not obsessed, this isn't a passion. And so therefore this customer isn't coming to beauty for what we would traditionally think of as fashion, like transformation, really changing what they look like, spending time playing with makeup. Um, this customer is coming with you know, more intention of like, how do I save time? How do I look my best? How do I invest um, in the right things to kind of take care of myself, but I have a limited amount of time and I want to, you know, do the most with what I have. So I think um, that has like pushed us towards, you know, how do we make it trendy to care for yourself? Mm -hmm. um, both because having an underlying foundation of good skin health, good hair health is, you know, something that is important, even when you're adding on more of the layers of makeup and it does help you have 
I don't know, just a sense of like, I know how to care for myself. I know how to make myself um, kind of, you know, basically exemplify that it's like the health that I have in my body is like coming through. Um, but also I think because we just feel like it's normal that women and men, you know, they don't come to the mirror and feel, you know, like confident and feel amazing about themselves. And we really believe like having that underlying knowledge and confidence in what you're doing and then ha having it show in your skin health and your hair health does just improve your sense of well being and your sense of self confidence. So we're trying to push that into like the trend. And I think it's more so, especially in this moment, becoming trendy to focus more on those like underlying aspects of beauty versus just the color makeup, which is also fun. Absolutely. When I started in this industry almost 20 years ago, fashion was its one category and beauty was its other category. And I felt that the two didn't really necessarily mix as much as they do now. And I think a lot of that has probably happened with the boom of social media, um, because now people more than ever have a huge platform to show what they look like and to recreate these looks themselves. Back when you were just reading print issues and there wasn't necessarily a way to share that with your hundreds or thousands or millions of fans, you know, you, you did your beauty, you did your fashion and you moved on. And I think beauty offers a really interesting segue into fashion and some of the higher end labels. Cause you look at brands like Marc Jacobs who has a beauty line and a fashion line. It's a great way for people to experiment with his brand and the magic of everything that he's doing when they can't necessarily purchase the clothes right now or they're not in a position where the clothes are appropriate for their office. Maybe they have a different, you know, work outfit that they have to wear. So just over time, I've seen such an interesting play between the two. And you've seen so many different fashion brands try to find a way into beauty. Um, with that said, what are some of the most interesting fashion, like the direct fashion and beauty collaborations that you've seen? And have you tested any of those in Birchbox? I'm trying to think of what's the most interesting. I mean, I think it's been interesting, honestly, to see. I, I know that like Tata Harper did a lot of like runway shows this year using skincare um, on models like for the actual shows. I find that to be like really interesting kind of those again shifts away from just being about like color cosmetics makeup and nail to this like underlying like making the entire body look radiant with face oils and um, you know those kinds of things I think are really fantastic to see like a celebration of just like natural looking self um, you know, with a little bit more oiliness, which is beautiful. I think we call that glow, <laughs> not oily. Yeah, I, really, I really like a nice oily skin. <laughs> an oily complexion is what I'm going for here. It looks so, it does, it's so attractive to me. It's so bizarre because I feel like as a teenager, I thought that was the worst and we were like powdering and mattifying ourselves nonstop. And now I'm like, how do I make myself appear to be damp? I have a thousand pounds of highlight around my face for this. It's the first time I've worn makeup and in, in going right. the collection. So no, it's so true. Yeah. Speaking so I think that's an interesting shift that people are, you know, trying to like meld to these things. You're seeing like um, oils and things like that instead of highlighters in some of these like shows and collaborations. Um, so yeah. We have a question from the audience, which actually segues into what I wanted to talk about, which is as we're talking about this, you know, aesthetic trend of the glow or the oily look, what are some other trends that we're seeing in beauty? Does, have you seen sustainability impacting a lot of what's happened in the industry? How have you guys tackled that as a brand? How do you look for that with partners and just other general trends? You know, there's CBD everywhere that, you know, what's kind of cool and next? I mean, right, I think right now we're still seeing the growth of what is like very misunderstood and widely defined category of clean. Um, sustainability is on its very, very early legs, but I think promising and interesting. So kind of going back to clean people, it's very on trend for people to understand better what's in product. Um, and then there's kind of a wide array of definitions from like very organic, only found in natural to just like simple ingredients um, that are safe and, and proven not to be doing any damage to you in any sort of way. So I think that shift in consumers building awareness around what is in product, what are ingredients that they like to see, what are ingredients they don't like to see is Katya is having a little bit of internet freezing oh. difficulty. So until then. <laughs> yeah, well, I can talk to you until she pops back up. <laughs> oh. How's it going on the side of communications when it comes to Daily Front Row and pivoting in these times? 
It's going really well. It's going as well as can be expected. I think anybody these days is maybe a little hesitant to say it's going great um, because, yeah. you know, no, we're, we're all dealing with a completely new paradigm in our lives. But being able to work in media and communications right now is really, there's a big opportunity because we're in a position now to really relay news, to set a tone for what's going on and to participate in a worldwide conversation that everybody's interested in. And you know, I mean, also everybody's trapped at home. So our website traffic is through the roof and, you know, all yeah. of our engagement is so high, which we love. So much. We've hit a, an interesting stride of what sort of content do people want to read? How much do we weigh in on the COVID situation and what's our place and what's our voice? And, you know, at the end of the day, we're not CNN. <laughs> I don't, yeah. or whatever news source people want to use. I just pick that one, but <laughs> you don't need to be reporting live grim facts about everything. We're all getting that everywhere else. Um, and we are happy to be a bright spot and to offer relevant content, fun content, things that are aspirational to give you that escape, but also do so without being tone deaf. Yeah, There's a lot exactly. of interesting stories that you see out there on other sites that I'm like, yeah, no, you have to have that balance. And I think how, how people yeah. are feeling when they read it. <laughs> yeah. And it is important though to take out that, you know, COVID, 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 go 24 seven and focus on something that will give you some type of hope and just have you let you have an escape. Of course, like you said, a tone deaf thing is super important, but I think that's really great. And while we wait for her to come back, um, so I have a question, so I'm just gonna <laughs> yeah, well, I'm here. So yeah, so my other question, so Daily Front Row, I know, um, you know, every time like I would go to a fashion week show, New York Fashion Week, for example, it would be there. Um, as far as like runway shows, what do you think that's was going to happen with that in the near future or in the future? Yeah, that is a hot topic. Um, I think what, look, I, I look forward to the world being a safe and healthy place where people can get out and can gather in groups. When that's going to happen, we don't know. Obviously, September Fashion Week is something that's on the forefront of everybody's mind because not only do we have to take into effect the, the, the fact of the gatherings and the safety and wellness, but there's also a lot of supply chain stuff that's going on behind the scenes right now that's going to yeah. impact how designers are going to be able to show. So speaking strictly from an event side, because that's where my, my expertise yeah. is, I would expect to see smaller more curated events. I hate the word curated. It's so overused. It's like that it's authentic and you're just gag me. But um, I think what we're going to see is a focus on the smaller group that designers need to be in business. That's buyers, that's top editors, that's, you know, people that are consuming that. Yeah. Fashion shows and events had largely become a place where it was Sorry, just inspiration. Hi, Katya. How are Hi. you? It just turned oh. off. Zoom just <laughs> went away. Well, you're back. Um, yes. I'll finish answering so, this quickly and then yeah. we'll get back in. Um, I think we're going to look at smaller presentations that are more thoughtful, but broadcast in a large way digitally, um, which is really cool because it's going to give everybody an opportunity to see things where they might not have had access before. So it's going to be a thoughtful group of people that are really decision makers and thought yeah. leaders. And then it's going to be the rest of the world, but through platforms like this. I like so. that. That makes sense. To me, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you, Kaja, for coming back. We were just having a little chat, but I'll, I'll let you guys take it from here. Yeah. Bye. Hi, Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. I warned you. I knew it was going to happen at one point. Internet happens. It happens to all of us. So, you know, we were we were talking about sustainability and, and clean beauty and things like that. A few questions have come in as you were rebooting about the sustainability aspect, which is important. Um, how do you address that in terms of smarter packaging and the sampling? Because obviously sampling is also something that does produce a tremendous amount of waste. How, yeah. Maybe it doesn't, but, you know, what's your view on that? And how are you addressing that? Yeah, it's always been a part of our kind of underlying foundation of Birchbox is to think about addressing it. And one of the big motivations for launching was this idea that we were all wasting so much um, product and creating so much garbage through the way we were um, discovering products, largely for our target customer for myself, like through mass, buying beauty at grocery stores, buying beauty in drug stores and not using it. And then kind of stockpiling shampoos and creams and because you're not loving it and you're trying the next thing. So one of the natural ways is by creating smaller things, discovering what you love and then purchasing the thing you love and using it to the end is like 
a very important step to reducing just creation of garbage. Um, from a packaging perspective, everything we do is from recycled material and can be recycled, but we're also looking at changing packaging further just to reduce. So we've always looked at how thin can we make it, you know, how can we make it even though it's recyclable and comes from recycled materials, just less and less and less. Um, but still we're looking at again, a big revamp because of that for um, either end of year, this year, or early next. And then I think in terms of brands and product, I mean, that is a part of a much bigger question of shift in terms of consumers' willingness to refill containers um, and to use things that don't have containers. But we're starting to see like really interesting movements. I'm sure you're seeing them too, where shampoos are coming in bars um, so that there's no bottle. And, you know, I think that's part of something that could shift, um, but it requires consumers to decide it's really important to them. And that's how those businesses go from being small kind of niche to having the groundswell and to being able to be part of a movement. Very cool. Well, I want to transition and talk a little bit about the workplace and where you straddle a very interesting line of being a powerhouse entrepreneur, but also being a mother of four, which congratulations to that, that you're even able to do this call. <laughs> so how has being a mom made you think differently about being an entrepreneur? I mean, it's completely 100% changed me in every way and definitely as a, a business person or as an entrepreneur. I think, I mean, the first thing it did was it really just helped me reevaluate priorities and recognize that the most important thing that I want to have an impact on is the day-to-day -day of my life and of everybody's life. So creating opportunity, a culture, and a place that really just celebrates the everyday um, versus is only about kind of these fleeting milestones that I think we all experience and don't really celebrate. So how can each day be a celebration of how we change um, the opportunities for our colleagues, how we grow and learn as individuals, and how do we actually take moments to reflect on that? Because I think for a lot of us, you know, it's hard initially, especially initially to leave your children, especially when you're first time mom. And um, I feel so grateful to have something else to do because I know that that helps me be a better mom. But initially it felt like it needed to be worth it. It needed to be something that I felt um, was a great expression of being a person. Um, so that has just really impacted me in thinking about how I think about winning you know, again, shifting from um, just like these milestones that are monthly, quarterly, annual, which I obviously are part of my life, but to just recognizing in the moment when someone's had an amazing growth experience, whether it's like a skill set or they're getting a great promotion or the way that Birchbox is impacting their expectations for their careers and their trajectory and celebrating that every day um, and kind of bringing more of our team's awareness to that being a really central aspect of what we do, I think is a really big thing that's shifted. Um, on the other hand, I've also had experiences with raising kids that have really impacted me as a manager and leader. I remember when I was sleep training my first kids that were twins, I had this like realization that when I went to them because they were crying and soothed them that that was for me. And it was a very short-sighted experience of making myself feel better versus helping them understand that they're okay. And I think very similarly in the early days of running Birchbox, when someone came to me and said, I have a question, I gave them an answer because it felt good in the right. moment, right? To just be like, and here you go. Um, and then felt like that's what they wanted. They asked, I had, and realizing that that doesn't actually create the kind of engagement and the kind of growth that people come to us for and that people deserve in their careers. Um, and so just that also has really informed my thinking. I feel like they're, the experiences are constantly informing each other where I'm like, wow, this thing that I'm experiencing as a parent is so relevant as a manager and vice versa. How nice to be able to apply that. And I would imagine you can apply things even more directly now that we're all working from home. And oh, people are I mean, still the, first few, the first few days of this, I would be so flustered if like my kids came in the room or, you know, I'm trying to have a serious conversation. And now I, you know, just dialing it back and saying like, what's so wrong with someone seeing me, you know, a, as a parent, you know, what's the big problem? Why, like, why am I getting worked up about it? It's not worth getting worked up about those things. So. Great. 
Well, talking about Birchbox, you guys are a global company and you operate in four countries, if mm -hmm. I believe I read correctly, um, which that is such a huge opportunity, but also provides unique challenges because the way we operate in the U.S. may not be how we operate in other, uh, the best practices for other countries. How have you successfully handled globalization and what has been your strategy to get you into those other countries securely? Yeah, well, first thing I'd say is that this experience has completely like impacted our global business positively because it's totally evened the playing field in terms of how we communicate and how we're sharing information, which is a huge part and an advantage if you can get that information flowing well yeah. to being global, right? Because we're in um, different markets that are at different stages of maturity with business models like ours. Mm -hmm. And it's very helpful to use those different stages of maturity to test different things or to avoid different things, but the communication has to be there. The connections between the teams have to be there. And right now, since we're all communicating this way, it's just really improved that overall. The way that we went global is through an acquisition. So when we launched, there was immediately a lot of companies that were inspired by Birchbox that launched. And um, we ended up acquiring one of them in 2014, 2012, gosh, 2012, two years into launching. Um, and that business had also acquired a few other businesses. So that took us into France, the UK and Spain. And we recently sold our French business. And now we are in the UK, who's also serving Ireland and Spain. So it happened through an acquisition. Um, and I'd say operating it well has been quite a learning experience going from trying to really be coordinated on everything and not do anything, you know, without informing the other and, and making like it very kind of rigid to being very different and kind of operating independently in every market to now finding real balance where um, we have the same shared vision, the same target customer, same brand, same style guide, and we're collaborating on global partnerships and on how we're telling our narrative to media, to consumers. So it's just taken a while to calibrate as things do. And typically, again, as one would expect for a first time entrepreneur, you kind of swing the pendulum hard in different directions, only to realize which is what is obvious, which is something in the middle is, is probably more ideal. Um, but we just had to learn that. Yep. Well, I'm going to ask you one, one big COVID question, and then we'll head to more questions from the audience. Um, you started Birchbox 10 years ago, um, right after or in the middle of a recession, then you've had a big amount of growth and you've had a lot of successes. And here we are heading into an economic downturn. Um, we don't know the exactly what's ahead of us, but what, with all of your experience, how are you preparing for what's ahead and what advice can you offer to those that might be in the position you were in 10 years ago or those that are just sort of worried about the economic climate now? I mean, I wish I, I wish I was all knowing. I, I think that one of the things that always attracted me and my co-founder to Birchbox and to the idea was that it was in beauty and we knew just from being, you know, young students of economics that that had a pretty strong record in terms of managing through recessions. Um, so we were very attracted to like the strength of beauty and kind of counter cyclical times and felt like that was a really underlying strength and foundation of what we wanted to build. I also um, believe like we were really focused on the attainability of the product, the price point of the product, um, kind of helping us also get through what could be seen as big challenges. And in the early years of Birchbox, but all the way through today, um, people really did describe it as being like the one thing they did for themselves every month, the one investment, you know, $10, $15 in other markets, but just this like very reasonable way of getting a treat and getting a gift. And we, I don't think we fully appreciated that until we had launched how important that was for our success in the early days um, where people were going through financial challenges of creating something that was very accessible that, basically hit on the intersection of like kind of does a job like it helps you get exposure helps you be smarter at consuming helps you discover but also is just joyful and this moment for yourself and being at that intersection has been so core to how we think all the time is how do you think very practically about like does this get the job done today how can we make the job better how can we make that clearer and also is it fun is it joyful does it show that this is a category that's discretionary um so for us i think having that moment and then being able to reflect on it has been really helpful i think if you're launching during this period of time showing 
two things that really occurs to me as I talk to entrepreneurs, like showing your tenacity right now is valuable and showing your scrappiness and figuring out how to get your product to market or some, you know, really not what you had in mind version of it, because showing that you like will not be stopped, showing that you are figuring out a way to get consumers in front of your idea, even if you can't bring it to life in the way you want. I think ultimately that's what anybody who backs you wants to see is that you're resilient and you really, um, you know, nothing will stop you in kind of bringing this forward. Um, and I know that's easier said than done. I also think that if you feel like you know, this is a stopping point for, for the idea for one reason or another, that's very practical. It's also a good thing to note too. If this is a stopping point and you need to kind of rethink about a different idea or what you want to do, I think taking that as data is good. Absolutely. Everything is data right now and it's all opportunity instead of necessarily opposition. Let's look at, look at how you can change and rejigger things a bit. Um, a question on trend related. What about men? Do you have any specific trends you can share or things that you've experienced with Birchbox for the, for the men out there? I mean, grooming continues to be a very interesting growing category. Um, I think the most interesting trend about trends for men that we're actually going to start seeing um, happening more and more now are just the willingness to add to the routine. So um, we probably all know that grooming has traditionally been kind of distilled down to like one step, one soap, does it all, maybe like a couple soaps and a deodorant. Um, but we're seeing, and we've seen since we've launched a lot of engagement in like, how do I care for myself? I want to know how to, you know, make my skin have less wrinkles or less blemish blemishes. And I actually um, was talking to somebody kind of new to the team and telling them about some of my favorite reviews on the grooming products where um, those customers are saying like, this is why women look so good and how have we not known about this? Um, and my husband was telling me that he's seeing people, you know, on social media, like husbands and some celebrities like use face masks right now because they have this downtime and they're saying, you know, that downtime is leading to the woman in their life using it. And so they're interested and curious and have time to kill. So I think it's just this like adding um, of the steps that is going to continue as a trend. Um, and I think right now we're going to see it pick up a bit. Cool. Uh, there's a question that came in for me when I was speaking with Jordana and you were having internet issues. Um, it was about being tone in the time of media and that there is a lot of news that's scary and negative out there. Um, and coming from a fashion outlet, where do we fit in in that? And somebody asked, what is the one piece of news that's recently been published that's put a smile on piece people's faces. I mean, number one, there's just fantastic cat content out there. So anybody like I'm a big animal meme person and there's so much going on, but as a serious answer, I think what has resulted from all this is there's been a tremendous amount of creativity because people are stuck at home and there's people always feel a bit braver and a little bit more ready to share things when they have this distance of the, the computer and the internet and Instagram posting. So there's been some really great things that influencers have posted. Jessica Wang has brought the biggest smile to my face on Instagram. She's created this whole series where she's wearing high fashion and she's doing her day-to-day -day chores. And the reason I love it is number one, it's artistic and it's beautiful and she's really put a lot of time into it. She's taking a nod, a cheeky nod at what's happening, but she's also doing it in a way to say, listen, we all are not living our absolute visions of best lives right now. How do we bring that in? How do we have fun with the situation and how do we, just evolve and still feel like ourselves. And I think that's something that's really important. Um, and the other, the other news that I've loved is just watching the fashion industry get involved with how to help, seeing the designers make masks um, for the nurses and people on the front line. Uh, it's just, it, it warms my heart to see people getting involved in ways that they couldn't before, or they're not able to do their own business and they're putting it forward. I think it's really just incredible to watch that and to see the rallying and the support behind it. So. That would be my answer. But if you want to laugh, go to Jessica Wang's Instagram account. She's brilliant. Um, so a question for you, how does Birchbox fit in with the current crisis and fashion, which we've touched on a little bit and, and how the beauty industry is resilient during this, but how specifically do you think Birchbox is going to fit in right now? Well, I mean, you know, I think Birchbox, again, in this position of like this small thing that you do to invest in yourself is continuing to, to see that um, opportunity and people are at home kind of a little bit more engaged in what they do to care for themselves and learning about how to care for themselves. So for us, we've we've really tried to take it as an opportunity to express kind of what's beneath the surface of Birchbox and what really differentiates us about 
our ambition, our intent, the relationships that we really want to have with customers that are not transactional, but where we are really um, able to express how much we care about your experience with beauty um, and grooming and the confidence you have and um, the way that it feels to actually take those five minutes you have every morning to get ready. Um, the intent that we have to make you feel just like a badass during that. So it's, it's given us an opportunity just to go a little bit deeper with the customer because there's a little bit more time to talk about what we care about versus um, I think what we felt like we've had to do is like captivate someone in three seconds with great merchandising or like a beautiful image. Um, and now just, you know, taking a minute to talk to our customers about who we are and, and really what we, again, what the ambition is for the relationship we have with them has been really wonderful. Um, and then COVID specifically, like we've been very focused on how we can give back and, you know, in as much as we can afford to, you know, just continuing to take what we can and give back. We've been donating um, birch boxes to the front lines just to have like those little moments of joy, which our customers have been really engaged in. And we're launching a campaign. We've been trying to find a charity to donate proceeds to, and it's been tough. They've, they've all been um, basically saying that they're not taking donations. So we're still looking if you have ideas mm -hmm. for who we should be donating to we're playing with other ideas around, you know, how can we help people who are out of um, jobs right now? And how can we be a part of that solution? I think this isn't going to be a fleeting thing. This is going to have a lasting impact. And like I said, you know, I, I believe like our goal is to think about like, what are the things that we can do every day to help build the world we want to live in? And we have to be, you know, very thoughtful and participate in that right now. And it's also just been really motivating to see how much the team cares about that too. That's wonderful. And that's so nice to hear that you guys are sending things to people on the front lines. I think that's, it, it makes us all feel like we can do something or we've done something when you see that content happening and those people really deserve it. Speaking on the content side, what sort of content do you think people are wanting to see these days? You know, I'm talking about here's a joyful piece of something that made me smile, but what what do you think from a brand side? What what do people need to what, what should you put out and what should your goals be? I mean, for Birchbox, we're really focused on the brand being human and not feeling like a corporation. And I think humans have different sides to them, right? There's moments when you want to stand in a soapbox and talk about something you care about that's very deep. There's moments when you want to look at cat videos or look at beautiful imagery and like, we're humans, we have different sides of ourselves. And I think the brands um, showing those different sides is what we're all, we all are trying to do and trying to focus on. Um, in as much as we can create for us content that looks and feels different in beauty, that's what we are trying to do because since we're going after a customer that's not obsessed, who the industry hasn't focused on, we don't want our content to seem similar to what's out there. We want the content to feel different. Um, and so we're playing with things like where we're weaving in you know, tutorials with some of these other like business advice or, you know, entrepreneurship advice. We're, we're trying out things to try to make it feel useful um, in different kinds of ways and still very human and relatable and approachable. Um, but I think that's, you know, what we're all trying to do is figure out what's the, what is it the consumers want to see? And I think it's a simple answer. They want to see like actual, you know, people, actual souls, actual hearts, they want to see like real things. So um, what do you actually believe in? What do you actually stand for? You know, how can you bring that to us in a way that is simple? It's easy, you know, we can understand it and um, we can care about it. Yeah. You brought up an interesting topic um, on weaving in professional advice with some of the beauty advice, which is a great way to have sort of a, a hard serving of news and then a softer side. With that said, what advice do you have for those that might be furloughed or facing unemployment right now? Is there anything just from your incredible background that you could give as a pointer or to give some hope to people? Because there is such a tremendous amount of those that are out there in the workforce or are no longer employed and it's, it's, it's a tough time. I know I, I cannot even begin to pretend I can solve this problem or understand exactly what it must feel like. I, I think, you know, you said something earlier about creativity coming out of this. And I remember feeling a little bit um, that way in 2008, 2010, graduating from business school, feeling like, you know, there are less jobs. And so maybe this is a great time to like fail at starting a company because it will be incredible um, to learn about that and to get that experience on my resume. So 
that is something that you can think about, like, how can this be an opportunity to change what you're doing and to reconsider, you know, skills you want to acquire? I, I think, you know, a little bit of a jolt and a reset to consider how you want to spend your time can be good if that's something you can do. Um, I also think that being creative about how you apply to jobs, you know, one thing that I remember in the early days of hiring for Birchbox is finding people who said, like, here's the job I will do for you. And just were so explicit about what they could do. And that was so valuable. That's great. Have you ever, is there a book that you've read that really helped you from like a business side? You said you became obsessed for the light word of it. Is there something that people should be reading now that might help give them ideas on creativity? Um, I don't think I had any specific book that was like a light bulb moment for me. Um, I've, I've enjoyed reading the um, Brene Browns and, and those kind of books recently in earlier days, it was kind of the Andreessen Horowitz I read Reboot, which is a book about entrepreneurship from Jerry Colonna, who's an executive coach. Um, and they definitely all inform it, but I still think you kind of have to experience a lot of the stuff for it to resonate and to be meaningful. My mom recently put on, as I, I came home for the COVID crisis, so I'm in Virginia, my mom put a book she had given me, I think at college graduation, like, what color is your parachute? With a little note of just like, in case you're thinking about things as the world changes. So that was one that, that sparked my question because it appeared on my pillow. <laughs> That's so nice. So yeah. It's, it's a fun time to connect with family. Totally. <laughs> so... But with that said, we don't have any additional questions from the audience. So do you have any last minute words of, of wisdom to share with us? I mean, I think that the most valuable thing that happened with Birchbox was just that we decided to launch it um, when it was not ready and not perfect and not exactly what we wanted. And something that I always just advise entrepreneurs is if you can try to launch some version of it and get out there so you can start to adapt, it's um, you know, it's so invaluable versus kind of all the planning and all of the perfecting that you could imagine doing. Don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. <laughs>